Hello and welcome to our May Storytelling Concert this evening. Tonight, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment and dedicate this concert to Mary Grace Tetner. Mary Grace is one of our founders of the San Antonio Guild, a stalwart nurturer for all of its years, a marvelous storyteller in her own right, and an outstanding human being for everyone who knows her. Mary Grace is undergoing some serious medical challenges today and tonight. And I know you join me in wishing her the best and Godspeed, a rapid recovery, and to be back leading the very vigorous life that she's always led. So I know if she were here, what she'd say to me is, let's get going with the stories. So tonight, our first storyteller comes, from us, comes to us from both San Antonio and the Akil Islands of, off the west coast of Ireland. That's Jane McDaniel. She is a wonderful storyteller, much sought after both here and across the pond. So without further ado, I'll let you tell her a little bit about yourself, herself and let her tell her story. Jane? Mute myself. Thank you. Well, I've been here 20 years, 20 plus. I haven't gotten an American accent yet. I'm working on it. It's taken a while though. So I find that the longer I speak, the more broad my Limerick accent gets. I live on Ackle Island off the west coast of Ireland for some of the year, planning on living there for longer. I've often walked along the West and my story tonight has something to do with the West of Ireland and with a time that was before time. Ireland is an old, old culture. And when you walk the West roads there, you go through the small places, villages and towns, La Hinch, Feenit, Ballybunion, Doonbeg, Milton Malby, La Hinch, with its broad sands and Doonbeg with, it, with its narrow, narrow dunes, sand dunes. And you look out to sea and you wonder what there was there years ago before the Irish as we now know them lived there and there were people there. The waters come in there from the wild Atlantic and you could almost imagine the times when people would not walk across there at night, when they were afraid to see the great white horses of Lord Doon, he of the dark face, the Lord of death. In Ireland, death and life and love and joy are close, close, close together. Lord Doon, he was the brother of Anya of Nakeni, she with the sun face. So there were two sides to him, but Lord Doon, he was the Lord of Death and he was the one who would wait in the shadows in his red palace and wait for the evening when he would go out to collect people. Sometimes you could see him chasing and racing across the, the waters of the Atlantic, of the ocean on his white horse or at the head of a host of horses. He didn't want to be out on those nights. But he had two sides to him. He was gracious as well as, as well as the Lord of Death. He was not like the Morrigan, one who reveled in the slaughter, although he was the Lord of those who died in battle, those who died with blood on them. He welcomed everybody to his red palace, kings and queens, merry girls, widows, old men, young children. He welcomed them all when their time came. And he waits and he watches quietly in the darkness. But tonight, someone has come to ask something of him. It is Fionn, the head of the Fianna. Long, long ago, beyond the misty space of twice a thousand years, there dwelt a mighty race, taller than Roman spears, and they, they were the Fianna. Fionn, Macul. He's broad-shouldered, blonde. He is known for his feats in battle, but he is also a boaster. He is a womanizer, and he is one who is loyal to his friends. And tonight he has come to ask for a boon, for a gift, a favor for his beloved. And his beloved 
his Knu Daroil, his musician. Now Knu Daroil was no bigger than four fists, one on top of the other, but he was the most amazing musician that you would ever hear. When he played his lullabies at night, you could see, you could see people in battle who were wounded and lying and crying. They would quieten, they would sleep, and women in full labor would quieten at his, at his lullabies. Fionn stood beside uh, Dunn, Lord Dunn, and you would think with his bearing that Fionn was the one giving out the boon, but no, he had come to ask. So he spoke and he said, if I could ask, if I could wish, there is something I would like to ask of you for my friend, for my musician. Although he is just bigger than four of my fists, one on top of the other, he is short, but he is a great musician. But he is a sad and sad and lonely man because he has no wife. I have looked for a long time for somebody small enough, his size, I've had no luck. Could you, Lord of the Red Palace, Look for him. And the Lord Dunn stood and said, yes, I can look, I can look. And he did, and he found Blachnet, who was also called Little Blossom, who was no bigger than Knu Daroil. And they were brought together and they lived many, many, many years together, happy, happy. And when Fionn travelled around Ireland on his big horse, they would ride with him on the back, the two of them, together, each one no bigger than four fists, one on either side, on the haunches of that horse. And when it rained, they would sit under Fionn's cloak. And when they were old and they died together, and they came to that land where the Lord Dunn had them, and Knu Daroil played his music so that those who had died would had sorrow still in their minds, remembered it and remembered it well with joy. Yeah, Lord Dunn was not just the collector of the dead. He also did good things. He was not just a sad person. He was also... He was also very gracious. He was seen in his black silk hat giving alms to a widow woman who had come out to cry in front of her house so that her children couldn't see her cry on a hungry Christmas Eve. He saved a herdsman's horse. He had good stories as well because when people died and he went to collect them or when people were ill he was not just one who gave the gift of life, but when people had had it enough, he was also kind. And that's my story. Thank you, Gideon. Ooh, was that eight minutes? Oh, yes. You're I didn't good. go over my time. I didn't want to go over my time. <laughs> Thank you very much. You were perfect. Okay. Thank you. Our next teller, we're putting all the people with accents on first tonight. Oh, yeah, so right. you'll know that our next teller, although she comes to us tonight from Austin, has somewhere else that she's spent some time in her lifetime. And that's Bernadette Mason. Bernadette, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're going to, uh, your story is tonight? Thank you. Um, I am very, very pleased to be here. Um, and anyone who knows me knows I have been here for a long time. I've also lived in Africa, in Libya, and uh, in the Middle East too. And here we are on May the 5th, which is a historical day for many people in and around the United States and in Mexico and around the world. But when we get to this time of year, um, there's always something, it's, it's a different feeling for me. And for me, uh, it is a reminder of why I live in Austin and not England, because on glorious days like today, when it's 70 to 80 degrees, um, we would call this an English summer. 
we wouldn't call this a spring day. And so I, I, it's my choice to be somewhere wonderful like Central Texas because of this glorious weather. Now, if I if this were an English summer day, it's a day like today where um, my younger sister, Verity, and my elder brother, Dominic, and I, we would make our way to the outdoor swimming pool, the Winchester Lido. And we would put it on our bathing costumes underneath our clothes, and we would each grab a towel, and then we would amble that safe 15-minute walk, yabbering all the way. Well, that would be my sister and me. My brother would walk about 10 feet ahead of us and pretend not to know us because we were silly, giggling girls, you know, how boys are. Now, the pool and the surrounding area were made of concrete. Many is the time a child would crash to the ground with their knees bloodied, tears pouring. The, the pool custodian was a man called Mr. Abraham, who was a caretaker, but not a caregiver. Now, I was one of those kids who always completely ignored the, the rules, which said no running, and I was forever falling over. And I can remember one particular time when I had tumbled down and my, I bled all over the concrete, and Mr. Abraham picked the gravel out of my knees and he said really gruffly, you damaged the concrete more than it damaged you. Well, I completely believed him. I, I was horrified. I mean, it was bad enough that I was wounded, but to be reprimanded for damaging the concrete added insult to injury. And I burst into tears, I bawled for, and in fact, it was so serious that my brother had to be called to calm me down. That's how bad it was. But do you remember those days when a little bit of disinfectant and a little blob of antiseptic cream and a sticking plaster which you call a band-aid, and I was fine. Bob's your uncle, I was on my way. Well, in many parts of the world, it is pool weather from May until October. Not so in England. Nevertheless, every year, regardless of the weather, on May the 1st, our pool opened to the public. And the absurdity of this will only come clear to you when I remind you that it's regularly frosty and it often snows in England in May. Nevertheless, there we are, May the 1st, the pool opens. One year, a journalist photographer from our local newspaper, the Hampshire Chronicle, came to my school, St. Peter's Roman Catholic Primary, and he said, Hello, kids. Who wants to be first in the pool on the 1st of May? Don't look at me. I, I didn't want to. Shark bait was my middle name. I could barely swim. I was a terrible swimmer. And there's no way I would have volunteered for this. And yet, apparently, I did. Well, of course I didn't. I was volunteered by my class teacher, Miss Truman. And I have never forgiven her for what happened next. On May the 1st, then, I was to be first in the pool, along with a boy from my class called Kevin Turner. I disliked Kevin Turner. I would not have chosen him to be my colleague on this adventure. When we were seven years old, Kevin Turner done me wrong. It was as a result of him forcing me to swap library books with him when we had been told quite specifically by our class teacher not to swap library books, that as a result of that, I got my one and only caning. My teacher was the only person other than the headmaster who was allowed to cane people. And I had stood up for myself. I had said, Kevin made me do it. But that was the worst thing I could have done because Mrs. Pryor didn't like tattletales just as much as she didn't like disobedient children. And so I was stood up in front of the class along with Kevin Turner and I got the cane. Well, after that, I didn't like Kevin Turner. But that's another story. <laughs> yes, move on, I digress. So on May the 1st, 
I arrived at the pool and it was one of those freezing blustery grey days and as I arrived a light drizzle began to fall. I went to the changing rooms, I, I put on my regulation black swimsuit and I, I pulled on my white cap and then I wrapped my towel around me to protect myself from the stiff breeze and the glare of the paparazzi. I was one of five gullible children who had turned up. There was Kevin Turner who was being punished. I was forced to volunteer, he was being punished and there were three other innocents from other local schools. Well, we, we huddled together like breeding penguins while Mr. Abraham, the dreaded Mr. Abraham, plotted with the journalist photographer from the Hampshire Chronicle. And we waited and at their instruction, we dropped our towels and we had our picture taken, teeth chattering <laughs> beside the pool. Well, I was just wrapping my towel around me when Mr. Abraham clapped his hands together and said, All right, you lot, in the pool. What? I, I looked at the grey choppy water and then I, I, I looked at the other kids and they were as dismayed as I, I was. And Kevin Turner was shaking his head. He said, I'm not getting in. Are you getting in? I'm not getting in. No. It was unanimous. None of us wanted to get in. I mean, when they'd said first in the pool, I, it wasn't so bad being at the pool. I didn't think they actually meant in the pool, but you know, grown-ups were in charge of this. So there was no question of us actually not doing what we were told. Nevertheless, we, the freezing five, gathered together, unanimous in our dissent. All of a sudden, I felt a hand in my back pushing me forward and Mr. Abraham pushed us into the icy water. Swish, 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 swish. All five of us, in we went. I screamed as if I'd been stabbed. Ah! It was the shallow end, so I didn't actually go under the water. Nevertheless, I screamed. And then there, there was this group gasp <gasps> as our feet touched the bottom. And then all five of us pulled together and we had our picture taken. <laughs> and then we were out of the water like cats who'd been pushed in the tub and hobbling towards our changing room on our frozen blue legs. Well, I couldn't feel my feet. I was pretty convinced I had frostbite. I, I put on my coat, my hat and my scarf because that's how cold it was and I was still denumifying myself. When I glanced at the chalkboard by the entrance where I saw the water temperature, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. You can die of hypothermia in temperatures that cold. Now, people are always going on about Barton Springs and it's balmy 68 degrees. Do not talk to me about that. Anyway, on Friday that week, the picture was published in the Hampshire Chronicle. My mother kept that black and white photograph for years. I wish I still had it to show you. I've not been able to find it online. I'm really sorry, I have looked. The caption beneath the picture said, on May the 1st, five brave young swimmers battle the water at the Winchester Lido. And our faces, those victims, the five victims, our faces are an image of fear, horror and betrayal. And I want you to know that every year at this time, I am reminded of that horrible incident and of the reason that I live in Austin, Texas. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Bernadette, thank you so much. What a wonderful story. I know <laughs> the rest of you, if you're anything like me, you have goosebumps on your arms thinking about jumping into a 50 degree Fahrenheit. My goodness. But you have to be young to be brave. <laughs> Continuing now with our tonight's tradition of ladies first, we are honored to have Leslie Ogilvy with us, who has braved the freezing Canadian winter, the snow <laughs> and sleet, and finally 
is now coming into spring, which I'm sure is pretty cold where she comes from in Toronto. But without further ado, Leslie, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us your story. Well, thank you, John. Uh, I did actually spend uh, the last six months, uh, the winter in Toronto, which is fairly mild because it's right by Lake Ontario and, and we were lucky uh, this year. Um, but now we're back up on our island. Um, I don't know if you can see, there's the lake right there. So we're in our little cabin up on this uh, little acre and a half island that we have in the Stony Lake, north of Toronto, about an hour and a half. So it's, uh, it's chilly right now, but, but we love it anyways. So thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, about eight years ago, I was fortunate enough to attend a storytelling conference in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And there I met a young British storyteller named Sean Taylor. He was living in Brazil because he had married a young woman from Sao Paulo and they were splitting their time between England and Brazil. Uh, he had traveled up the Amazon River by boat and collected stories from the people living on the banks of the Amazon. And he gave me uh, a copy of the picture book of stories that he had published. Uh, and so tonight, I would like to tell you uh, the first story in that book, and my most favorite one of all of them. Uh, it's a love story. And I had originally planned to tell it to you um, when I was down in San Antonio at our meeting in February 2020, but we ran out of time. So uh, I'm going to tell it to you tonight. Uh, and I think really it's um, a good story for the times that we're living in. So this is it, it's called Harutai. Long ago, deep, deep in the Amazon rainforest, there lived a bird called Harutai. One night, Harutai was perched in the leafy branches of the forest and he lifted his face to the sky and he saw the moon. She was perfectly round. She gazed gently down at him and cast her silvery light across his face and Harutai fell in love. Harutai fell in love with the moon and he wanted to be with her. So he flew to the top of his tree, but the moon was still far away. He flew to the top of the, topest, uh, the tallest tree he could find, but still the moon was so far away. And so he flew to the top of the highest hill, but still the moon was so very far away. He knew he would have to fly to her, and so he flew up into the air, up and up, up until his eyes were burning, until his wings were exhausted and aching, until every breath that he drew made him feel hollow inside. He wanted to keep going, but it was just too hard. He couldn't do it. And suddenly, his wings gave out on him and he tumbled back down. Down he fell, down he flapped, down he tumbled and turned until there he was, back in the leafy branches of the rainforest. He perched and, and blinked up at the moon. He could never be with her, she was just too far away. All he could do was sing to her. And so Harutai sang the most beautiful song that was in his heart. It was a song full of longing, a song full of loneliness, a song filled with love. The moon stared down at him, but she didn't reply. And Harutai's eyes began to fill with tears. His tears fell to the ground. They rolled across the forest floor. They flooded valleys and they rushed to the sea. And people say that this is how the mighty Amazon River was formed. 
there is still a bird called Harutai that lives deep, deep in the Amazon rainforest. And sometimes when the moon is full, he will lift his face to the sky and sing. And I have heard that the people who live there will light great bonfires and sing and dance around them to encourage Harutai to sing, for they know that singing the most beautiful song that's in your heart is the best cure for sadness. And they think that we should all light fires in our hearts when the Harutai within us grows silent. Leslie, thank you so much. What a beautiful, beautiful story. And even though we don't light fires like they do in South America, the next time we all go to our barbecues, we will offer it up to the moon and to love. Thank you again. And Marcus, can't wait Marcus. to see you again in, uh, in San Antonio. And speaking of San Antonio, now we're going to change over to the boys. And our first storyteller is Larry Johnson. Uh, who's going to tell us a story called The Legend of Tex of the Texas Blue Bonnet. And I've never heard it before, so I'm sitting at the edge of my seat. Larry, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us your story. Well, thank you. And I'm very, very pleased to be here with you. And I have to thank uh, Jane McDaniel for telling me about the group and uh, inviting me to to be a, a visitor. So I visited you last month and I uh, decided to be brave enough to offer you a story this month. I'm originally a Yankee born in Chicago and uh, then I moved to Mexico City and lived there for 17 years and then came to Texas. And I've been in Texas for over 40 years. So I kind of think of myself as a Texan, but Texans don't uh, yet accept me. I think I have to be here 50 years before I become a loyal Texan. But you know, there are many, many interesting legends uh, that come out of Texas. And this time of year, May, is a beautiful, beautiful month because of the spring and the flowers. And, and one of those flowers that we can see grow wildly along the roadside is the blue bonnet. And so the question is, well, where did the blue bonnet come from? And so I found the story of the blue bonnet. Great spirits, great spirits, the land is dying. Your people are dying too. The long line of dancers sang Tell us what we have done to anger you. End this drought. Save your people. Tell us what we must do so you will send the rain that will bring back life. For three days the dancers danced to the sound of the drums. And for three days the people called Comanche watched and waited. And even though the hard winter was over, no healing rains came. Drought and famine are hardest on the very young and the very old. Among the few children left was a small girl named She Who Is Alone. She sat by herself watching the dancers, and in her lap was a doll made from buckskin, a warrior doll. The eyes, nose, and mouth were painted on with the juice of the berries. It wore beaded leggings and a belt of polished bone. And upon its head, there were brilliant blue feathers from the bird that cries, Chee! 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 She loved her doll so very much. Soon, she who is alone said to her doll, soon the shaman will go off alone to the top of the hill to listen for the words of the great spirits. And then we will know what to do so that once more the rains will come and the earth will be green 
and alive. The buffalo will be plentiful and the people will be saved. As she talked, she thought of the mother who had made the doll, of the father who had brought the blue feathers. She thought of the grandfather and the grandmother that she never knew. They were all like shadows. It seemed long ago that they had died from the famine. The people had named her and cared for her. The warrior doll was the only thing that she had left from those distant days. The sun is setting, the runner called as he ran through the camp. The shaman is returning. The people gathered in a circle and the shaman spoke to them. I have heard the words of the great spirits. The people have become selfish, he said. For years they have taken from the earth without giving anything back. The great spirits say the people must sacrifice. We must make a burnt offering of the most valuable possession among us. The ashes of this offering must then be scattered to the four points of the earth the home of the winds. When this sacrifice is made, drought and famine will cease. Life will be restored to the earth and to our people. The people sang a song of thanks to the great spirits for telling them what they must do. I'm sure it's not my new bow that the great spirits want, a warrior said. Or my special blanket, a woman added. As everyone went to their teepees to talk and think over what the great spirits had asked. Everyone that is except she who is alone. She held her doll tightly to her heart. Looking at the doll, she said, You, you are my most valued possession. It is you the great spirits want. And she knew what she must do. As the council fires died out and the teepee flaps began to close, the small girl returned to the teepee where she slept to wait. The night outside was still, except for the distant sound of the night birds. Soon everyone in the village was asleep, except for she who is alone. Under the ashes of the council fire, one stick still glowed. She took it and quietly crept out into the night. She ran to the place on the hill where the great spirits had spoken to the shaman. Stars filled the sky, but there was no moon. Oh, great spirit, cried she who is alone. Here is my warrior doll. It is the only thing I have for my family who died in the famine. It is my most valued possession. Please, please accept it. Then gathering twigs, she started a fire with the glowing fire stick and the small girl watched as the twigs began to catch and burn. She thought of her grandmother and grandfather her mother, her father, and all the people, their suffering and their hunger. And before she could change her mind, she thrust the doll into the fire. She watched until the flames died down and the ashes had grown cold. And then, scooping up a handful, she, who is alone, scattered the ashes to the home of the winds, to the north and the east, to the south and the west. And then she fell asleep until the first light of the morning sun woke her. She looked out over the hill and stretching out from all sides where the ashes had fallen, the ground was now covered with flowers, beautiful flowers, as blue as the feathers in the hair of the doll, as blue as the feathers of the bird who cries, Jane, Jane, Jane. 
when the people came out of their teepees, they could scarcely believe their eyes. They gathered on the hill with she who is alone to look at the miraculous sight. There was no doubt about it. The flowers were a sign of forgiveness from the great spirits. And as the people sang and danced their thanks to the great spirits, a warm rain began to fall and the land began to live again. From that day on, the little girl was known by another name one who dearly loved her people. And every spring, the great spirits remember the sacrifice of that little girl and fill the hills and valleys of the land now called Texas with the beautiful blue flowers that we call blue bonnets. And so, as we silently thank that small Comanche girl for her unselfish sacrifice so long ago, let us try and emulate her example in our own lives today. Wonderful. Wonderful, Larry. Thank you so wow, much. Larry, that wow, Larry, wow. That was terrific. Absolutely. I can have story. And now staying in the state of Texas, we have a fellow Texan, uh, Jason Pike. Jason, tell us a little bit about yourself and... Tell us yeah. your story. I'm a, I'm a career military guy, uh, retired from the Army, and I've got a lot of stories. I spent uh, 31 years in the Army, and uh, I'm in the uh, storytelling group with the Armed Forces uh, uh, storytellers, and so uh, I've got one for you if you're ready. We can't wait. We're <laughs> okay. at the edge of our seat. Okay. So... I'm 27 years old. I'm in South Korea. I'm a quiet, confident, strong lieutenant. I've got a great success uh, record in my military service. Uh, and uh, I, I was in an airborne unit. So I had an airborne patch on my chest. I'd been, I'd, I've jumped out of airplanes and was in a pretty good special ops unit. And uh, now I'm in South Korea and I want to compete for something called the uh, expert field medical badge this is a this is a no joke badge you 80 to 90 percent fail rate is normal uh, you got to be really really good to get this badge and this expert field medical badge is about getting people off the battlefield stabilizing them before they go to the hospital so uh many different parts to the test uh on this particular event uh i was night land navving Light night land navigation, finding points on a map, areas on a map, using a map and compass to demonstrate your ability to get around uh, on land in the woods or rice paddies or whatever. So I'm walking down this road and it's dark and uh, it's a moonless night. It's pretty dark out there. And uh, on the left side of the road is a ditch I need to cross. Okay. It's a pretty big ditch. I keep walking for a safe place to. Uh, to cross the ditch to get to an area I need to look at on the map and get to a point on the map. Well, all of a sudden, I slip on shit, I slide in shit, and I'm in neck deep in shit. Now, this is a real story. All my stories are real. I am in neck deep shit. It's like a quicksand material. It's feces that they use to <clears throat> fertilize the rice crops. And uh, I can't feel the ground below me, all right? Uh, and I don't want to die in this. I'm feeling shocked. It's very, very smelly. Uh, it's putrid. I feel like a gag in, uh, influx. It's just really bad situation to be in at night in neck deep of shit. Um, so what I do is, um, well, some things are going across my mind. I'm thinking, wow, if I get out of here, they're going to be calling me Poop and Pike, and that's what they're going to name me. <laughs> I'm going to be called Poop and Pike. Oh, and the, I mean, it'll be etched in stone. It'll go on forever. That's if I make it out. And I'm thinking I could easily die in here because it's sort of a quicksand. Every time you move, you kind of go down a little bit. And if I die in here, you know, I, at the time, I didn't have a family, didn't have any children. Uh, those things are running through my mind. And uh, this is not a way to go. Uh, uh, Pike dies and shit on the demilitarized zone in South Korea. That's not a good way to go. I slowly start to uh, move my legs to go up at a 
45 degree angle and then slowly get horizontal on top of this poop, the feces, the shit. And I low crawl out of it, okay? Once I get out of it, I'm across the ditch now, but and I'm on dry land. I feel very, very thankful. I'm thinking I'm relieved, but I've got a mob of stuff on me. So what I do is I roll around in the grass and the rice stubble to get the bulk material off. But you also know that this stuff is liquid. It's also seeped through the material, all my clothing and web gear and things of that nature. I look around. I think, wow, I'm not going to ask for any help. I got to find someone who's local. I see a, a light uh, and. Uh, I start walking towards the light. I think it might be a farmhouse. I don't even know. Uh, I start walking toward the light. At this time, I don't know if I'm walking toward heaven or hell. I'm just walking towards the light. And uh, it is a farmhouse. And uh, I go right up to the front door. I knock on the door. And I go, Ajima, Ajima, Anya Haseo. I don't speak Korean, really. I mean, that's, I, I, but I know some, some very small basics. The woman of the house, the Ajima, comes and looks at me and goes, Agu, Agu. That means, and uh, we do hand signaling and waving, and she motions me to strip down butt naked. And the plan was to strip down, give her the clothes, and she was going to bring it back to camp later. I know. I, and so I strip down in front of a completely uh, strange person. I don't know. We don't barely speak English and Korean and things. But we're doing sign language, nonverbal stuff. And uh, at this point, I, I wasn't embarrassed be, to be in front of a complete because I was running off of adrenaline. I was running off of, uh, I'm in an emergency situation, I'm in a very desperate situation. So I give her all the clothes naked right there on the front porch. All I now have is my rifle, my map, and my compass, and I walk butt naked back to the camp in the woods, uh, barefoot, of course. And uh, as I'm going by, I'm thinking, wow, you know, I might make it back to camp before um, everyone else gets in, and that'll be good because, and uh, and because I see them out there in the woods, they're looking, they're doing their testing events as well, and they can't see me too well. As I told you, it was a moonless night, there's not a lot of ambient light out there. And so uh, I do remember saying hello uh, to some folks and good luck, but I would keep my distance, of course, not to let them know that I'm walking back naked. And uh, I do make it back to camp and I'm still smelling, I still got to clean up some more because it's, and I take my things out of the tent and I decide to sleep outside that night, of course, I'm going to call it a night, of course, uh, and uh and in the morning, uh, Ajima, she, the woman, she comes in and gives me all my stuff right there under the tree outside the tent. And, uh, and I say, come uh, da, come da, thank you, I'm thanking you, I'm thanking you, I'm thanking you. She goes off and I sit there on, I think, wow, you know, this badge is going to be very difficult to get. I didn't get it on that time, but later on I did get it. And I was thinking as well that, uh, you know, Maybe I'm not so good after all, but there's some great things that occurred. I had a lot of luck. I got out of it with my face uh, intact and my reputation intact. And uh, it took me a while to talk about my event of falling into shit. Uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great story. I'll tell you. It's all true. Next time, you know, I guarantee next you, it's time true. that I feel like complaining, <laughs> about anything jason that's I'm a shit good story people who are complaining <laughs> about anything well i'm going to think of you and say it could be worse <laughs> <laughs> that's a shit good story <laughs> oh what a wonderful story well thank you very much uh now we're going to turn to one of our younger members uh our favorite young man nathan hollander and nathan is going to share a story with us, uh, or perhaps a poem this evening. Nathan, why don't you tell, for those who don't know you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then tell us what you're going to do to this evening. Go ahead, Nathan. Okay. Hi, I'm Nathan Hollander. I am I'm a young man living in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm a beginning storyboat teller, and I'm just happy to share a, a story with you tonight, and Say, um, have, are you any of you familiar with the Mexican state of Jalisco? Well, it is known as the tarantula capital of Mexico. And you're probably wondering, how did so many tarantulas happen to settle down there? Well, the story I'm about to tell you is an urban legend that just may give you a clue. You see, uh, one, once there was a plant collector 
who lived down there in Jalisco, Me Mexico. And he, co he collected all kinds of plants of every shape and size. And one day, this man went to a flower store, you know, like one of those garden stores that you see along the road. And there, right there, he saw the most beautiful cactus plant he had ever seen in his life. And he knew he just had to have it. And so he happily bought the plant and he took it back home and put it on his shelf with among all his other rare plants. And every day he gave that cactus plant a spray of water from his favorite spray bottle. And he did this every day until one day after he sprayed the plant with water, the plant shook. The man was most surprised. He sprayed it again. Again, the plant shook. By, and by now, the man was very curious. And so he took the plant outside, placed it on his driveway, and then he, gra he got a machete and he cut open the cactus plant. And to his horror, out poured a swarm of tarantulas. They crawled all over his driveway, all over his yard, and all over his neighborhood. Soon there were tarantulas everywhere, all over the city. People were finding tarantulas in their cupboards, in their beds, in their drawers, and even in their food. They were, they were all over the place. And nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew how to get rid of them all. And that is why, to this day, Jalisco has been known as the tarantula capital of Mexico. <laughs> and that's my story. Very good, Nathan. Thank you very much. It reminds me of my one and only tarantula experience. And when... My children were in high school. The church that we belonged to adopted a village in Guatemala called Santa Maria Ceja. And it was just south of, of the Mexican border, but out in the jungle. Uh, the only way you could get there was either stand in the back of a truck for about four hours. And even as a young man, four hours in the back of a pickup truck going through what could only graciously be called a road was horrible. The other way was to fly in a uh, Piper Cub over the mountains, which in that area can reach up to eight, 9,000 feet. So that literally it's, you feel like the Flintstones, that if you put your feet down through the floor, you could actually touch the top of the mountains. Well, when we got to this village that we had adopted uh, named Santa Maria Ceja, we were exhausted. And the only building in the village that wasn't made of straw and vines and other things like that, huts, were, was the church. And the people being very, very gracious, uh, wanted us to sleep on the benches in the church. And the church also had the only light. It was a solar light uh, that looked somewhat like the fluorescent lights that we have here in, uh, in the United States. And so exhausted, we trooped in, we put our stuff by the side of the bench and went to sleep. Now, you have to realize these are a bunch of suburbanites from the Boston area who, most of whom would scream at the sight of a spider that you almost needed a microscope to see. But here we are and we're exhausted and we're sleeping on these benches and the solar light is on because it had collected enough energy during the course of the day to provide for light that night. So we immediately fell asleep. And during the course of the night, the solar light lost its energy. 
And so we first went from bright light to more diminishing, 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 and finally to darkness. And the only light that you could see in the whole church. Now, this is a church that, not like we think of, this, this is really just a, a, an elongated wooden building, perhaps 30 feet wide and 90 feet long. With the roof that simply sits on top of some wooden trusses. So between the roof and the wall of the church, there's a big space. And in through that space, anything that's up there flies back and forth. So once we descend into this darkness, little did we know that the dark is when everything comes alive in the jungle. And all of a sudden, I have to go to the bathroom. Now, there is no such thing as a bathroom that I'm used to. And so I began to look for a way out and to go outside. Well, as soon as I put my foot down on the floor, I hear all of this scrambling, scratching. <laughs> and I look down towards the window, which is in the front of the church. It's open. I mean, there's no glass in it. And there, underneath the window, I can see what looked to me spiders the size of lobsters. Now I'm familiar with lobsters because I lived in New England for a long time, but these are not lobsters. And their tails are whacking back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I, oh God, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. But I went outside, went to the bathroom and I spent the rest of the night with my feet up on the bench, wide awake. Well, we spent a week in the village. And the second night, I noticed a different phenomenon that, you know, I told you that the roof just sat on top of these wooden posts before the wall tipped in. So there was an open space about, oh, 30 inches wide between the roof and the walls. And when the light was on, I hadn't noticed it the night before because I was still so tired. There were bats that flew in, attracted by the light. They flew in one side of the church, under the roof, and out the other side. And then they always came in from the same side, which I, I thought was odd. But then as I watched them more closely, I discovered what they were doing. And as they flew in, there were all kinds of other bugs, smaller bugs, mosquitoes and flying insects, everything else like that. They were acting almost like a vacuum cleaner. They would swoop up and swoop an entire line of flying insects out of the air, into their mouth, and out the other side of the church. Well, I thought, well, this is fascinating. This is, I mean... Here's a place that doesn't have uh, any exterminators or, or, or screens or things like that, but nature is certainly taking care of its, some of its pest control. Now, in terms of the tarantulas, as I said, I was terrified, absolutely terrified, as was the group that we were in. But by the end of the week that we were there, and some of the other experience that's a story for another time that we had, I didn't care if they crawled on me as long as I was able to get some sleep. And that's my tarantula story. Well, thank you all for being with us this evening. We really enjoyed having you here. We hope that you're going to join us again on June 2nd for another storytelling conference. And we hope that all of you are healthy, remain healthy and do whatever you need to stay healthy because we love our members, we love our guests, our storytellers, our listeners. There would be no storytellers without listeners. So thank you again and we'll look forward to seeing you 
on June 2nd. 